I shall leave it to others to distill the contents of this book into dry theories. These might become a contribution to the psychology of prison life, which was investigated after the First World War and which acquainted us with the syndrome of barbed wire sickness. We are indebted to the Second World War for enriching our knowledge of the psychopathology of the masses. If I may quote a variation of the well-known phrase and title of a book by Le Bon. For the war gave us the war of nerves, and it gave us the concentration camp. As this story is about my experiences as an ordinary prisoner, it is important that I mention, not without pride, that I was not employed as a psychiatrist in camp, or even as a doctor, except for the last few weeks. A few of my colleagues were lucky enough to be employed in poorly heated first aid posts, applying bandages made of scraps of waste paper. But I was number 119, 104, and most of the time I was digging and laying tracks for railway lines. At one time, my job was to dig a tunnel without help for a water main under a road. This feat did not go unrewarded. Just before Christmas 1944, I was presented with a gift of so-called premium coupons. These were issued by the construction firm to which we were practically sold as slaves. The firm paid the camp authorities a fixed price per day per prisoner. The coupons cost the firm 50 fennigs each and could be exchanged for six cigarettes, often weeks later, although they sometimes lost their validity. I became the proud owner of a token worth 12 cigarettes. But more important, the cigarettes could be exchanged for 12 soups, and 12 soups were often a very real respite from starvation. The privilege of actually smoking cigarettes was reserved for the capo, who had his assured quota of weekly coupons. Or possibly for a prisoner who worked as a foreman in a warehouse or workshop and received a few cigarettes in exchange for doing dangerous jobs. The only exceptions to this were those who had lost the will to live and wanted to enjoy their last days. Thus, when we saw a comrade smoking his own cigarettes, we knew he had given up faith in his strength to carry on and, once lost, the will to live seldom returned. When one examines the vast amount of material which has been amassed as the result of many prisoners' observations and experiences, three phases of the inmate's mental reactions to camp life become apparent. The period following his admission, the period when he is well entrenched in camp routine, and the period following his release and liberation. The symptom that characterizes the first phase is shock. Under certain conditions, shock may even precede the prisoner's formal admission to the camp. I shall give as an example the circumstances of my own admission. 1,500 persons had been traveling by train for several days and nights. There were 80 people in each coach. All had to lie on top of their luggage, the few remnants of their personal possessions. The carriages were so full that only the top parts of the windows were free to let in the grey of dawn. Everyone expected the train to head for some munitions factory in which we would be employed as forced labor. We did not know whether we were still in Silesia or already in Poland. The engine's whistle had an uncanny sound, like a cry for help sent out in commiseration for the unhappy load which it was destined to lead into perdition. Then the train shunted, obviously nearing a main station. Suddenly a cry broke from the ranks of the anxious passengers. There is a sign! Auschwitz! Everyone's heart missed a beat at that moment. Auschwitz. The very name stood for all that was horrible. Gas chambers. Crematoriums. Massacres. Slowly, almost hesitatingly, the train moved on, as if it wanted to spare its passengers the dreadful realization as long as possible. Auschwitz. With the progressive dawn, the outlines of an immense camp became visible. Long stretches of several rows of barbed wire fences, watchtowers, searchlights and long columns of ragged human figures, grey in the greyness of dawn, trekking along the straight desolate roads to what destination we did not know. Then you will live to see that in the long run, in the long run I say, success will follow you precisely because you had forgotten to think of it. Should the following text of this book, dear reader, give you a lesson to learn from Auschwitz, 
The foregoing text of its preface can give you a lesson to learn from an unintentional bestseller. As to this new edition, a chapter has been added in order to update the theoretical conclusions of the book. Drawn from a lecture I gave as the Honorary President of the Third World Congress of Logotherapy in the Auditorium Maximum of Regensburg University in West Germany, June 1983, it now forms the Postscript 1984 to this book and is entitled The Case for a Tragic Optimism. The chapter addresses present-day concerns and how it is possible to say yes to life in spite of all the tragic aspects of human existence. To hark back to its title, it is hoped that an optimism for our future may flow from the lesson learned from our tragic past. VEF, Vienna, 1983 Part 1. Experiences in a Concentration Camp This book does not claim to be an account of facts and events, but of personal experiences. Experiences which millions of prisoners have suffered time and again. It is the inside story of a concentration camp told by one of its survivors. This tale is not concerned with the great horrors which have already been described often enough, though less often believed, but with the multitude of small torments. In other words, it will try to answer this question. How was everyday life in a concentration camp reflected in the mind of the average prisoner? Most of the events described here did not take place in the large and famous camps, but in the small ones where most of the real extermination took place. This story is not about the suffering and death of great heroes and martyrs, nor is it about the prominent capos, prisoners who acted as trustees having special privileges, or well-known prisoners. Thus it is not so much concerned with the sufferings of the mighty, but with the sacrifices, the crucifixion and the deaths of the great army of unknown and unrecorded victims. It was these common prisoners who bore no distinguishing marks on their sleeves whom the capos really despised. While these ordinary prisoners had little or nothing to eat, the capos were never hungry. In fact, many of the capos fared better in the camp than they had in their entire lives. Often they were harder on the prisoners than were the guards, and beat them more cruelly than the SS men did. These capos, of course, were chosen only from those prisoners whose characters promised to make them suitable for such procedures, and if they did not comply with what was expected of them, they were immediately demoted. They soon became much like the SS men and the camp wardens, and may be judged on a similar psychological basis. It is easy for the outsider to get the wrong conception of camp life, a conception mingled with sentiment and pity. Little does he know of the hard fight for existence which raged among the prisoners. This was an unrelenting struggle for daily bread and for life itself, for one's own sake or for that of a good friend. Let us take the case of a transport which was officially announced to transfer a certain number of prisoners to another camp but it was a fairly safe guess that its final destination would be the gas chambers. A selection of sick or feeble prisoners incapable of work would be sent to one of the big central camps which were fitted with gas chambers and crematoriums. The selection process was the signal for a free fight among all the prisoners or of group against group. All that mattered was that one's own name and that of one's friend were crossed off the list of victims though everyone knew that for each man saved, another victim had to be found. A definite number of prisoners had to go with each transport. It did not really matter which, since each of them was nothing but a number. On their admission to the camp, at least this was the method in Auschwitz, all their documents had been taken from them, together with their other possessions. When I began in comedy, I was so protective of who I was and where I came from. I was trying to write my jokes in the fashion that others wrote, and as a result, I didn't develop the truth of who I could be as a stand-up comedian. Once I was no longer afraid to open up about me and my truth, things changed for me professionally. Talking about my truth allowed me to expand my material. I was no longer afraid to talk about my mother, who taught Sunday school, or my failed marriages, or my growing up in Cleveland. This was the first time I came face to face with real integrity. 
As you grow your integrity, one of the first pieces to focus on is learning how to lead. We get too focused on looking to other people at times when the real answers lie inside of us. We have to take the time to recognize our own strengths and weaknesses. I think what makes me effective as a person of integrity on the radio or as a spokesperson is that people know I am going to tell them the truth no matter what that truth is. You don't always have to agree with it, but I'm telling you my truth. I think that people have grown to respect that. Give yourself a real self-evaluation. Improving your makeup also means that you have to be willing to give yourself a real self-evaluation. When I write a joke, I go out on stage, I give a joke three shots before I decide to throw it away or keep it. If I tell the joke and it gets a big laugh, I rate that joke a one. If I tell it and it gets a laugh sometimes, then that joke is a two. If I tell a joke and most of the time it doesn't get a laugh, that's a three. When I first started, I needed those jokes because I needed the time. You're paid 15 minutes to open, 30 minutes for the middle set, and 45 minutes to headline. I needed this time so I could become a headliner. I learned that if you're out there telling threes, that's a shaky set. So every time I wrote a new joke and it was a two, I got rid of a three. The only way I did that was to have an honest assessment with myself. I kept writing jokes, and when I got a one, I would get rid of a two. After a few years, I had all ones. That's when I really started developing as a stand-up, when I created that system of self-evaluation. Your personal self-evaluation has to be one of complete and total honesty. The only one who can do the self-evaluation is you. Until you're ready to have a completely honest conversation, even a self-evaluation will do you no good. I know that I don't care about mundane details. I have to hire somebody around me who is good at those repetitive details. I also know that I'm not good with graphs and charts. I learned that in college. You cut the lights and put a graph on the wall, then I'm going to sleep. So I hire people who like graphs. I don't like having to repeat myself over and over again to get a person to understand something. I don't have the patience for it. I also have to constantly watch myself and work on not coming up short. Real integrity is knowing where your shortcomings are. Setting the right balance. Your core makeup also has to have the right balance. Through all of my experiences, I have learned that the following order is essential for every successful person. God, family, education, business. If you prioritize your life in that order, success is yours on whatever level you want. In my life, I have come to realize that God has to be first. I used to have business first, education second, family third, and God last. Until I got that order right, I couldn't get my life together. After putting God first, you have an obligation to take care of your family. You cannot have children and not take care of them. How do you expect the universe to take care of you if you don't start by taking care of your child? How do you think more blessings will come to you if you won't take care of the blessings you already have? Regardless of the relationship you have with your child's mother or father, you are obligated to take care of that life. Same thing applies to your husband or your wife. Once you have God and family in the right order, now you need to focus on education. When I refer to education, that doesn't always mean going to a four-year institution. You should always be educating yourself about your gift and whatever business you're in. You may have to go back to school to get a certificate of training in your area of interest. For me, there was no school for learning how to do comedy. My education was watching the greats of comedy to see what they did to become great. I had to spend a lot of time observing what other comedians before me did. I also had to spend a lot of time educating myself about show business. The phrase show business should really be recognized as two separate words. If I have a great show, it is because everybody who came to see me enjoyed themselves. But there's no business in show business if I don't know how to book myself and charge for my shows appropriately. It could be a great show, but without the proper steps in place, there is no business. On the flip side, 
You can have a good business sense and know how to get booked everywhere. But if you're not funny, you will not be invited back. Be open to what comes next. Another part of your makeup that is essential for your success is learning how to be open. You can't get so stuck in how you do things that you aren't open to seeing and doing things in a different way. Get honest. Now is not the time to start lying to yourself. If you're tired of the way you've been living, it's time to give that up. I want you to go to a mirror right now, look yourself in the eye, and be honest with where you are right now. Don't reason it away. Don't blame it on somebody else. What is the thing you do that keeps blocking you? Look beyond your excuses and ask yourself why. Your answers might be fear, failure, family circumstances, or finances. If the answers don't immediately come to you, this may be the time to seek pastoral or professional counseling. Don't be afraid to get the help you need to live the life you deserve. Get real. This is where we get to the good part of replacing your negative actions with positive ones. Is procrastination killing you? Replace it with a strategy that will get you into action. Do you refuse to admit when you are wrong? Enlist a partner or a friend to keep you accountable for your responsibilities. Whatever the issue, make a commitment to get real and find positive and responsible replacement actions. Here's the problem with people who think that they have a makeup that they really don't have. If you're asking the question and answering it too, you don't have the real makeup. You don't have the real answer. All you're doing is constantly telling yourself what you want to hear about you. You have to be willing to have a bone-chillingly honest conversation with yourself. The only person you are cheating is you by not being frank about the situation. Get new habits. Once you've become honest with yourself and you identify new actions for tackling your weaknesses, here comes the hard part. Changing your habits. Psychologist Jeremy Dean challenges the myth that it takes only 21 days to change a habit. It may take two years to fully make a shift in some areas of your life, but that's now two productive years for a lifetime of reward. Don't worry about how much time it takes to make the shift. Time is in our favor when we use it productively. Focus your energy on developing your new habits. Just take it one day at a time. And when you get done with one day, I want you to do something revolutionary. I want you to get up and do it again, and again, and again. Pretty soon, this won't just be some new habit you're trying to conquer. This will be your new roadmap for success. Changing your makeup with integrity. I have had so many times in my life when I have had to change my makeup. I had to start becoming a more positive person with integrity to get the job done. I think the biggest shift for me was during a joke writing period. I learned a lot from Richard Pryor. What made Richard Pryor so great was his openness. He was willing to talk about all of it. His growing up around after hours joints, his catching on fire, the arguments in the car, and his marital issues. That's what made him most effective. Some of you may feel like you already have your life together. Let me be the first to tell you, congratulations. Now that you have it all together, let me ask you this. What's next? Knowing what's next is paramount to your success. The what's next is the reason to keep waking up. The what's next is the driving force for all successful people. There always has to be a what's next. You might already be a millionaire. Again, congratulations on your success. But in order to stay a millionaire, you have to make more millions. You can't sell the same book. You can't tell the same joke. You can't keep singing the same song. You have to make a new album. So I ask you again, what's next? There has to be a reason to get up tomorrow. There has to be a reason to go forward. Your calling has to be stronger than your current circumstances to help your dream keep moving forward. What other makeup do you need? Every person's unique gift will dictate how he or she will operate in the world. Someone who specializes in working with children will need to be patient and caring. 
while stockbrokers will need to be sharp, exact, and quick on their feet. If you aren't sure what traits you need to work on, think about the skills for which people give you the most compliments. Are you good with details, great with connecting with new people, or know how to set up a good meeting? Catalog your skills and put in the work to make them even better. Next, take stock of the characteristics that people constantly tell you that you need to improve on. For example, are you prone to skipping steps or do you become frustrated during tight deadlines? Don't just chalk up poor characteristics to, well, that's just the way I am. Remember that perfecting your character is as much a part of your development as executing your gift. Outside of taking your own self-inventory, who are the people you admire and respect in your industry, your house of worship, or your community? Talk to them about how they learn to stay cool under pressure, or ask them about the makeup you need to become the type of leader you want to be. Trust me, they didn't get to where they are overnight, and any good leader worth their salt will be more than willing to pour good wisdom and knowledge into your life to help you grow and succeed. Be the kind of man or woman you want to be by taking on the right makeup, which will make room for your gift and lead you to the best opportunities for expanding it to an even wider audience and a bigger stage. Each prisoner, therefore, had had an opportunity to claim a fictitious name or profession, and for various reasons, many did this. The authorities were interested only in the captives' numbers. These numbers were often tattooed on their skin, and also had to be sewn to a certain spot on the trousers, jacket or coat. Any guard who wanted to make a charge against the prisoner just glanced at his number and how we dreaded such glances. He never asked for his name. To return to the convoy about to depart, there was neither time nor desire to consider moral or ethical issues. Every man was controlled by one thought only, to keep himself alive for the family waiting for him at home and to save his friends. With no hesitation, therefore, he would arrange for another prisoner, another number, to take his place in the transport. As I have already mentioned, the process of selecting capos was a negative one. Only the most brutal of the prisoners were chosen for this job, although there were some happy exceptions. But apart from the selection of capos, which was undertaken by the SS, there was a sort of self-selecting process going on the whole time among all of the prisoners. On the average, only those prisoners could keep alive who, after years of trekking from camp to camp, had lost all scruples in their fight for existence. They were prepared to use every means, honest and otherwise, even brutal force, theft and betrayal of their friends in order to save themselves. We who have come back, by the aid of many lucky chances or miracles, whatever one may choose to call them, we know the best of us did not return. Many factual accounts about concentration camps are already on record. Here, facts will be significant only as far as they are part of a man's experiences. It is the exact nature of these experiences that the following essay will attempt to describe. For those who have been inmates in a camp, it will attempt to explain their experiences in the light of present-day knowledge. And for those who have never been inside, it may help them to comprehend and, above all, to understand the experiences of that only too small percentage of prisoners who survived and who now find life very difficult. These former prisoners often say, we dislike talking about our experiences. No explanations are needed for those who have been inside, and the others will understand neither how we felt then nor how we feel now. To attempt a methodical presentation of the subject is very difficult, as psychology requires a certain scientific detachment. But does a man who makes his observations while he himself is a prisoner possess the necessary detachment? Such detachment is granted to the outsider, but he is too far removed to make any statements of real value. Only the man inside knows. His judgments may not be objective, his evaluations may be out of proportion. This is inevitable. An attempt must be made to avoid any personal bias, and that is the real difficulty of a book of this kind. At times it will be necessary to have the courage to tell of very intimate experiences. I had intended to write this book anonymously, using my prison number only. 
But when the manuscript was completed, I saw that, as an anonymous publication, it would lose half its value, and that I must have the courage to state my convictions openly. I therefore refrained from deleting any of the passages, in spite of an intense dislike of exhibitionism. Frankel gives us a moving account of one collective therapeutic session he held with his fellow prisoners. At the publisher's request, Dr. Frankel has added a statement of the basic tenets of logotherapy, as well as a bibliography. Up to now, most of the publications of this third Viennese school of psychotherapy, the predecessors being the Freudian and Adlerian schools, have been chiefly in German. The reader will therefore welcome Dr. Frankel's supplement to his personal narrative. Unlike many European existentialists, Frankel is neither pessimistic nor anti-religious. On the contrary, for a writer who faces fully the ubiquity of suffering and the forces of evil, he takes a surprisingly hopeful view of man's capacity to transcend his predicament and discover an adequate guiding truth. I recommend this little book heartily, for it is a gem of dramatic narrative focused upon the deepest of human problems. It has literary and philosophical merit and provides a compelling introduction to the most significant psychological movement of our day. Gordon W. Allport Gordon W. Allport, formerly a professor of psychology at Harvard University, was one of the foremost writers and teachers in the field in this hemisphere. He was author of a large number of original works on psychology and was the editor of the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology. It is chiefly through the pioneering work of Professor Allport that Dr. Frankel's momentous theory was introduced to this country. Moreover, it is to his credit that the interest shown here in logotherapy is growing by leaps and bounds. Preface to the 1984 edition. This book has now lived to see its 73rd printing in English, in addition to having been published in 19 other languages, and the English editions alone have sold almost two and a half million copies. These are the dry facts, and they may well be the reason why reporters of American newspapers, and particularly of American TV stations, more often than not start their interviews after listing these facts by exclaiming, Dr. Frankel, your book has become a true bestseller. How do you feel about such a success? Whereupon I react by reporting that in the first place I do not at all see in the bestseller status of my book so much an achievement and accomplishment on my part as an expression of the misery of our time. If hundreds of thousands of people reach out for a book whose very title promises to deal with the question of a meaning to life, it must be a question that burns under their fingernails. To be sure, something else may have contributed to the impact of the book. Its second theoretical part, Logotherapy in a Nutshell, boils down, as it were, to the lesson one may distill from the first part, the autobiographical account, Experiences in a Concentration Camp. Whereas part one serves as the existential validation of my theories. Thus, both parts mutually support their credibility. I had none of this in mind when I wrote the book in 1945, and I did so within nine successive days and with the firm determination that the book would be published anonymously. In fact, the first printing of the original German version does not show my name on the cover, though at the last moment, just before the book's initial publication, I did finally give in to my friends, who had urged me to let it be published with my name at least on the title page. At first, however, it had been written with the absolute conviction that, as an anonymous opus, it could never earn its author literary fame. I had wanted simply to convey to the reader by way of a concrete example that life holds a potential meaning under any conditions, even the most miserable ones. And I thought that if the point were demonstrated in a situation as extreme as that in a concentration camp, my book might gain a hearing. I therefore felt responsible for writing down what I had gone through, for I thought it might be helpful to people who are prone to despair. And so it is both strange and remarkable to me that, among some dozens of books I have authored, precisely this one, which I had intended to be published anonymously so that it could never build up any reputation on the part of the author, did become a success. Again and again I therefore admonish my students both in Europe and in America don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, 
the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, and it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself, or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen, and the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscience commands you to do, and go on to carry it out to the best of your knowledge. It is characteristic of Frankel's tolerant outlook that he does not repudiate Freud, but builds gladly on his contributions. Nor does he quarrel with other forms of existential therapy, but welcomes kinship with them. The present narrative, brief though it is, is artfully constructed and gripping. On two occasions I have read it through at a single sitting, unable to break away from its spell. Somewhere beyond the midpoint of the story, Dr. Frankel introduces his own philosophy of logotherapy. He introduces it so gently into the continuing narrative that only after finishing the book does the reader realize that here is an essay of profound depth and not just one more brutal tale of concentration camps. From this autobiographical fragment, the reader learns much. He learns what a human being does when he suddenly realizes he has nothing to lose except his so ridiculously naked life. Frankel's description of the mixed flow of emotion and apathy is arresting. First, to the rescue comes a cold, detached curiosity concerning one's fate. Swiftly, too, come strategies to preserve the remnants of one's life, though the chances of surviving are slight. Hunger, humiliation, fear and deep anger at injustice are rendered tolerable by closely guarded images of beloved persons, by religion, by a grim sense of humor, and even by glimpses of the healing beauties of nature, a tree or a sunset. But these moments of comfort do not establish the will to live unless they help the prisoner make larger sense out of his apparently senseless suffering. It is here that we encounter the central theme of existentialism. To live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in the suffering. If there is a purpose in life at all, there must be a purpose in suffering and in dying. But no man can tell another what this purpose is. Each must find out for himself and must accept the responsibility that his answer prescribes. If he succeeds, he will continue to grow in spite of all indignities, 